All right, so today's topic is just going to pick up from logarithms and exponentials, and we're going to talk about how we can use what we know about exponents and solving for them in terms of exponential modeling. So exponential modeling is quite a useful tool to have as engineers. Basically, you observe some real-world behavior, and then you can fit one of these graphs to it. Um, and that lets you know some characteristics about exactly what you've observed. Uh, so we just saw some of these graphs. So here they are on Desmos. So it's quite easy to plot these on Desmos. All you have to do is type in log, and Desmos knows what you're talking about. Or you type in the exponent as a variable, and Desmos will plot it for you. My mirror line here just shows me that these are inverse. So when I said that one is the inverse of another, that's what I'm talking about, is that these functions are mirrored over this y equals x line. So, so that's the orange one. Can you see that one? Yeah. That's a diagonal, 45 degree, y equals x. So every time x equals 5, y equals 5, it's the exact same value. So that's this one here. Uh, so the special case of exponentials is the natural logarithm, or e. And this one is also mirrored. So here's another Desmos plot. So we can see e to the x there in blue. Uh, and its inverse is ln x, or this could be written as y equals log base e of x. So that says log base e of x. Where e is a number, just like pi. So e and pi, now we can add it to, we can add e to our toolbox just like pi. So e is a special number, 2.718, 28, and then there's another 18 and another 28 here, and then it keeps going. So this is an irrational number. It can never be written as a fraction, just like pi. The decimal numbers in pi keep on going forever. Uh, and then these are my special points. So ln of e, equals one, and you can try that on your calculator. To do that on your calculator, you have to press ln and then shift ln to get to the E function, and then evaluate. So ln, shift ln, and that should come out to equal one, and you can try ln of one as well, just press ln one, and evaluate, and that should come out to zero. So you can test these points on your calculator. If you get confused, you can sort of just go back to the calculator to confirm what curve it is that you're talking about. Okay, so these are some properties of exponential graphs that we've already talked about. So I wanna get into some of the patterns that come up in exponents. So Here's sort of a, a, a party trick or a kid's game, right? You take a piece of paper and you make a bet with your friend to say how many times you think you can fold a piece of paper in half. Uh, and then you threat th set the threshold at like seven. And you say, I'll give you $100 if you can do eight, if you can do eight folds. And of course, he's a, he's a bit skeptical. So he says, you got to give me odds. And you say, that's fine. I'll give you 100, but I'll give you 20 to one. So you got to give me $5 if you can't do it. And then you go about it and you fold a piece of paper. And because of the doublings, every time you fold a piece of paper, which paper do I want to fold here? Because of the doublings, right, it becomes very difficult to get past a couple of folds. So one fold gives you two squares. Two folds, when you undo it, gives you four. So three folds. 
And then when you undo it, if you count, you should have double the squares. So you should have eight there. And it's kind of getting a little bit awkward. Then you go four, five, right? So by the time you get to six, it kind of looks not very neat. It looks a bit like a ball. And then you might get to seven if, you're, if your folds are really good and you're really strong, but I don't think you'll get to eight. So that's my challenge to you. Get to eight. And I think they busted it on Myth, Mythbusters. They got a giant sheet of paper. That's a good uh, example of extreme lengths to go to to beat this exponential pattern. So we can see here the relation between folds and rectangles. Uh, and then the pattern says x number of folds as my input. I'm making a function. And then 2 to the x is my output. Or written another way, we could say f at x equals 2 to the x. And now even though you're able to describe this nice and easy, now you have a mathematical model. And the nice thing about the model, well, why would we bother doing this? The nice thing about the model is that after eight folds, it's hard to verify. So you could say, what happens when I put in 10? If I could fold it to 10 times, and then you calculate two to the 10. And you say, well, how many squares um, do I have after 10 folds? Well, I have two to the exponent 10 of them. Okay, so let's apply this to some data. So real world data, and we'll basically be doing, just looking at some data for a while here. So going back in time, 4,000 years, not too many people were alive, or at least you can't tell because of the scale. And we've got a few blips here in the graph. Uh, we've got a, a downward blip here. There was a plag in the 1350s and then uh, a few others in history that affected population. But basically we had sort of, it doesn't look like much growth. And then you get this like knee bend in the curve or this hockey stick sometimes it's called. And then the curve shoots up. And if you try to model this, you can't fit a parabola to this data. And I think we tried to do this last class. So if I were to try to draw a parabola Right, maybe I could get my parabola to look something like this, but then of course a parabola shoots back up. And so I need a completely different function at, and you can play around with it. Um, but the best type of function for this is going to be an exponential. And for any practical use, we're going to be using E as our base for an exponential function. So even though two to the power X is an exponential, we'll often be using E to the power X. And we'll see more about why we do this next week when we start talking about derivatives. Okay, total population. So, so far it hasn't really been curbed if you take the full scale. So by the full scale, I mean, you gotta go back in time and you know anthropologists have figured out approximately how many people were living in the past and we know how many people are living presently or we have a pretty good estimate. Okay, here's some more data. So what do we have here? We have uh, mortality rates, and now we see a pattern where it's decreasing. So these blue lines, it's not a nice smooth decrease, right? But the trend overall is decreasing. And if you look at what we've got here, we've got measles, typhoid, diphtheria, and Nowadays, in modern times, pretty much everyone gets vaccinated for these when they're babies or young children. Uh, and so even though the virus or the disease can spread, you have natural antibodies and you fight it off and you don't get sick straight away. Uh, and so we can see some effects here. Diphtheria is introduced and that then causes the mortality to decrease, which is a good thing, right? High mortality means more people are dying. Here it says per per 100,000 is the is the metric. Uh, and we, of course, want it to be down near zero. Uh, and so the other ones here are not as obvious, but the same sort of trending behavior. 
So the difference here, yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So all of these are exponential, but they're a decrease, right? Before we had an increase. So these all experience an exponential decline or decrease or decay is another word, and they all kind of sound the same. Um, but still we can model it as an exponential function. And the way to get an exponent just, we'll come back to this, but the way to get a decrease is to have y equals e to the negative x. So that should give us a decrease. So let's uh, pause and go have a look. Okay, so exponential, we could use two to the x and that looks like that. But because of the nice properties of the number e, we often use e to the x, generally for our exponentials. Uh, and so this one here is a nice increase. By increase, I mean going forward in time, which is to the right on the x-axis. Right? We can see that that one is increasing quite a bit. So in order to have a decreasing exponential, what we can do is have a negative in the exponent. And this negative is actually just a mathematical mirror about the y-axis. So my y-axis is this line here. And if we mirror about the y-axis, then going forward in time on the green line, I have a decrease. And I've done that by putting a negative in the exponent. So if I can change this back and forth and have it sort of dance here by going from negative to positive. So still an exponential function. Okay, what did I have coming up next? Estimated annual rate of drug-related deaths in the U.S. 1980 to 2005. So here, the data, again, it's not very smooth, but we can see some trends. And so in the early 80s, maybe it was a little bit flat, indicating that maybe that's sort of a baseline especially in a country of two to 300 million people, right? You're going to have a baseline amount of accidental drug-related deaths. Uh, but then if you're looking at the numbers, we have a steep increase in these years. Uh, and so maybe this is part of your job. Maybe you're a public health worker and you're analyzing the data. Or maybe you're allocating funding, right? And you're trying to do the best for your population. You need some data to show you that yes, actually we do need some drug intervention problems or programs because we have a problem here. And in you know 2004, per 100,000 deaths, you could say that 11 of those were, were drug related. And maybe that number doesn't mean much, but if you compare 11 deaths to 10 years ago when you only had two, you can see the increase. All right, and this sort of thing, uh, you know, could be used as this sort of stat and chart could be used as motivation for you to say, hey, well, if we don't do anything, what happens in 2010? So for maybe 2010 is over here, right? So we're past this now, so we could go back and find the data. But if we didn't do anything, what you could do is extrapolate this graph and come up with some number right here, 
come up with some figure way out here and say, hey, look, if we don't do anything in the next five or five or six years, you know, we're going to be up to 20 deaths and we'll have, you know, that's like maybe a four or five times increase. Uh, and so exponential functions, if you have a good model, you can actually predict the future. That's right. I mean, in one sense, it is grim, but in another sense, if you don't have the data and you don't have the math, then how can you be expected to improve the situation and make it better? So sure, it might be grim on the surface, but it's one of those things I think it's the, the more you know. So a good model here can predict the future or at least show you a trend to at least tell you that you're, in this case, trending up. Too depressing? Absolutely. I think a lot of people would have the same uh, the same feeling. You know, I, I suppose being being a doctor or an ER surgeon or a nurse isn't isn't for everyone as well for similar reasons. Okay, so maybe this one's not so depressing. Facebook data. Okay, so the question is, what function fits the graph? So here we have users between December two thousand four and October two thousand and fifteen. So part of an exponential function is that in the beginning, you can't really tell what's going on. And it doesn't really look like you're on an exponential trend down the beginning, especially when we're zoomed out. So you can't really tell what's happening. And that's because Facebook is in the early days. You know, it's only accessible by university students and only in the US. Uh, and then as that sort of caught on, it was made accessible to more and more people and more and more countries. And we kind of have the bend here, so a different function. And then we have this trend up to 2015. So I suppose we could update it for 2020 data. Um, but the idea here is to sort of think about what function can fit this graph. So this is in millions of users. And so this is 1,500 million, which is 1.5 billion users. So a big fraction of planet Earth has at least signed up for Facebook. That's right, 1,550 million. So here, this graph shows that an exponential actually doesn't have to fit the whole graph. So maybe from 2009, until the end of the data set, maybe in here, what we can do is plot a different function. So a different function, something like this. And maybe that one is linear, right? From 2009, we have linear growth. And before that, In this region, maybe you have exponential growth. So an exponential function doesn't have to fit the whole data set. And if you're going to be a data scientist or if you're going to analyze certain data sets, um, right, my red dots here, this is just observed real world data. So you just go out, take some data, uh, and then you go back to the office and try to figure out what you can do with it. Um, so you don't have to fit a function to the entire data set here. So that's the point that I'm trying to make with this Facebook graph. Okay, what else do we got here? Bitcoin. So the price of Bitcoin in the early days stayed pretty much flat looking at this graph. This, this is the zero line, here's zero. So the price was just slightly above zero. Not much going on 2015, 2016. It starts to creep up in 2016 and 2017. And then we have a vertical behavior here or we have this knee bend indicating exponential growth. 
Uh, and this is near the peak. It peaked at about $19,000. And then after this, actually, there was an exponential decline in the value. So if I were to continue this graph on, we had an exponential decline in the value of Bitcoin after this. So if you're looking at financial data, uh, predicting the future can be quite lucrative if you're looking at financial data because presumably you could use it to make money. So if you could predict the future price of something, um, if your model is good enough, you might actually make money with it. Okay, let's kind of look at a case study. So indeed, Bruce said that uh, mortality rates were a bit grim. Hopefully uh, COVID-19 is not as grim or maybe we got over that. So this morning I loaded in some data of the number of total cases outside of China. So let's go have a look here. Okay, so this site is just tracking uh, the data. So we can see some information here. Deaths have just hit 10,000. So we can see some graphs here. So this is total cases, including China. Of course, it hit China very hard early on. And now Italy is the new leader in terms of number of cases and fatalities. And so this is cases outside China up until yesterday. And then I added in a data point for, or up until two days ago, and then I added in a data point for today. So that's one source. Let's look at this one as well. So this data dashboard is by a medical school in America, John Hopkins University. And so this one is very good. You might have seen this on the news or on blogs. So this one has an interactive map showing all the known cases. Of course, if you have unknown cases, you can't record the data. So this is showing all the known cases in the world. Okay, so heavy websites taking a bit to load. We'll have a map in the middle here. And you can interact here. So if we zoom in on our local neighborhood, Okay, so here's Australia, 681. I think Australia is a good one to follow in the news because I think we're next. Uh, so obviously New Zealand's much further down the list for now. Uh, so there we are, that, that's pretty good. I mean, it's amazing that that school in Dunedin, that none of the other students managed to test positive after the one student did. So that that's good news. I mean, we're, we're here with Senegal and Liechtenstein. Okay, so you can't really see it, but this is where they're updating the number of daily cases. So the yellow line is other. We're up to 161 from 133.8 thousand. Okay, so I put this data in from January. So again, th this is just outside China. So we had January 23rd, it's hard to think back. This is before school started. You were up to whatever you were up to on your summer break. And there were 15 cases 
outside China. As in at the end of January. Okay, and then the latest data point said, well, this morning it was 156,800, 156,800. If I go back now, it says 161. So it's gone up since 8 a.m. So let's update my spreadsheet. What did I say it was? 161. Okay, so using a tool like Excel, we can make a graph of this. So I've got here days. So days are going to be on the x-axis and then total cases on the y-axis. So I'm just going to select my columns. And then I'm going to go insert and pick a chart. And I'm going to use scatter to show me the chart. You can use other charts, right? You put a line between them, um, bubbles, or what do we have here? Column. You might want a column chart like that. I like scatter charts. So get my scatter chart going. Is that better? I should have, I should have done that so that you could see this this one a little bit better. Uh, anyways, if you want to find this, you can just type in CSSE and it'll come up. Okay, so here's my Excel graph. On the X axis, I've got days, and on the Y axis, I've got total number of cases. Now, this is just overall total, right? If you want to know how many are presently infected, you need to subtract those that have recovered. But if we just count the total cases, we can obviously see a type of behavior here from my blue dots. So let's use Excel to fill in the blanks or add a model. So if I right click on the data, I can add a trend line. And then I get my options for trend line. So the trend lines here are my mathematical models. These are the types of functions we've been studying. So linear, and here's the best fit for a linear function. And it's a terrible fit because, for example, in January, it predicted you know, negative 25,000 cases, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, and it's also a terrible model because it only crosses the, the data at maybe two points. So maybe we want to try a logarithmic fit. And we know what the graph of y equals log x looks like. We've got an asymptote down here. And then it goes out to positive infinity to the right. Polynomial. So here's a, it says order 2. So that's degree 2 polynomial. Again, it's a terrible fit because the number of cases decreases into the negatives. And then it starts increasing again. And it only crosses three times. That's a terrible fit. So a better fit is going to be our exponential graph. So when we click on exponential, we get the blue dotted line. And we can see it models very closely down here, the cases. And then recently, the number of cases is sort of ahead of my, of my blue line. But I can actually help myself out here. So there's some data options down the bottom. So display equation on chart, that's going to be helpful. We'll look at that. Display the R value and set the intercept. So first I'll make this bigger so we can see it. OK, so there's my equation. We can see E, that's my exponential, and then X up here in the exponent. And then we have an R squared value. Okay, how do I go back to my trend line here? Okay, so the other thing I wanted to do is look at this value of the intercept. So it says set the intercept. So this means the Y intercept. 
And so on day one, I had 15 cases. So that means that I'm going to start at 15. And let's see if that makes it better. So after I set the intercept, now we can see my blue dotted line looks bang on my data points. And so this is the type of analysis that people have been doing. Uh, and they've been using it to show that this um, virus is spreading in an exponential manner. Uh, and how well is it spreading? Well, we have a mathematical model here that we can use to predict. So I'm going to, let's move this up a bit. Right, let's move this up a bit. I've got some questions here. So question A, what type of model fits the data? So I've kind of already talked through this. What kind of model fits the data? So this means, is it a linear fit? Is it a parabola? Um, you know, is it a sine wave? Does it oscillate? Does it go up and come back down and go up and come back down? Uh, and using the models in Excel, we've kind of decided that this one so far looks the best. And it's an exponential model because you can see it, it's got the E in it for exponential. Okay, B, how many initial cases do we have? Now I know from the data, how many initial cases do I have, but let's use the math. By the way, R squared, does anyone know what this means? So R squared just is a, is a measure of how well your data fits sorry, how well your model fits the data. So the highest you can get is one. So one is a perfect correlation between the, where's my mouse, between the virus numbers and the equation, okay? And it's not often that you'll see data that gets very close, but you can think of this as like 97 out of 100, meaning the math fits the data very, very well. If this is like 0 0.5, then it's not very good, and if it's less, then you probably want to throw it out completely. So that's what that value means. Okay, so what I'm going to do is... Okay, so how many initial cases? So let's use our formula. So we have 15 times E, and then we have a factor here, 1, 6, 3, 6, and then times X. So I need to know that the x-axis is number of days. And to find out my initial one, this is like the very first time that you get some data, we're going to sub in x equals 0. And we'll see this for a lot of our examples. So for initial conditions, We're going to use x equals zero. And so all I'm going to do is sub in x equals zero. And if I have zero times this number, well, then that's also going to be zero. And now we remember earlier, I said there were some special points, e to the power of zero. You can use your calculator but it's one. So this is 15 times one, which is 15. Okay, so you, just using the math, we sub in x equals zero. And then on the y-axis, we know that y represents number of cases. So that tells me that this means 15 cases initially. And that's fine because on the Excel sheet, we knew that there were 15 to start with. And that's where I set my intercept of my function. Uh, so that also gives us, you know, some insight into what the 15 means in the equation. Yeah, that's right.
Okay, so how many days have passed if total cases today are, okay, so we got to update this, right? That was a couple hours ago. We're up to 161,000 now. So this is going backwards in time. If I know that there's 161,000 today, based on the model, how many days have passed? Now we could look at the graph or we could look at the data, but let's use the model. So 161,000, that means that that is, 161,000 is in here. So that's total cases. And I'm looking to solve for X for the number of days. So the data I have here is the Y value. So I'm gonna sub in 161,000 equals 15 times my equation factors and then x is unknown. Okay, so x there is what I'm solving for. Okay, so first off to solve, let's move the 15 to the other side. So we'll divide by 15. To simplify my equation a little bit, and now we're back to the core of what logarithms do. Logarithms are designed to be able to solve for an unknown exponent. And anytime I have an E in my equation, I'm going to use the natural log LN to solve for it. So the strategy now is to take a natural log LN of both sides. And so that looks just like this on there and I'll just squish it in long there so you just take long on both sides that's your next step now on the left you can calculate that on the right you still have to extract the X out of the exponent in order to solve for this so I have a shortcut here. I know that ln of e to the something x or ln of e to the x is just x. So on the right, this simplifies to 0 0.1636 times x and there's no exponent anymore. And then on the left, we'll just evaluate this number. So let's see what that is. So that's 9.28 on the left. Oops, oops. Yeah, the zoom is good, but you can't write when it's zoomed in. Okay. So on the left, that's 9.28. So I'll just divide by 0.1636 to solve for x. And I get x equals 56.73. Everyone all right with the calculation? Just the, the math bits? Yep. Um, this part, how do I go from here to here? Yeah. So for this step, to go from here, What I have is this. 
as an identity. So LN and E are inverse of each other. So what you're doing here is you're undoing the original operation of X. And so when you raise an exponent by a base of E, you're undoing it with the natural log LN. And so this you can think of as a key or an identity. We take the X, and we move it back down in front, and then we know that ln of E equals one. So the more uh, examples of these that we do, you'll see how we just use this one over and over. Okay, so my x-axis is in days. And since we were solving for an exponent, we're not gonna get whole numbers. We're not gonna get nice integer values. So we've got 56.73 days. And because it's out of the mathematical model, this is just an estimate. And we say 56 days since it began. If I look at my graph, it looks like it's been about 56 days of data. Now, of course, you could just look at your Excel sheet and say, oh yeah, I've got 56 days there, but we're using the math to go back and figure it out. Yep, so that's the first step, and then you gotta keep going with that calculation. Okay, maybe the next bit is going to be a bit grim. When are we going to hit a million, right? When will one million cases be hit? And then in brackets here, Obviously, we hope that the spread slows down, um, but if there's not enough intervention and the virus is left to spread, um, we can presume and predict when we're gonna get to one million. Okay, so one million cases, that's the y-axis. So that's how many cases? So one million on the left, and then my model on the right. And since we're talking, since when means, you know, the time, the X value here is what we're looking to solve. Okay, so take a second to solve for this new X. Yeah, a million is one with six zeros. What do you got? Anybody else got 67.8? Give another decimal place, 67.89. 
Remember, this is days. And now we also need to remember that today, from this data set, is day 56.73. So if we round to 68 minus 56, now it's just an estimate, right? This is just a model, but if things keep going the way they have been, this is only 12 days away. And it's the nature of exponential growth is that in the beginning, you're not too sure what's happening. And then at some point, it almost becomes too late and the growth gets carried away. So potentially in two days, and since it's a, a worldwide thing, not just counting New Zealand, it seems likely that it's only a matter of time until we get to 1 million. So maybe we can check back in two weeks and see if our model was correct. This one's also based on this one's based on population growth. So population growth could be we saw the graph of human population, right? But it could also be things like bacteria and it could be uh, animals in the wild. If they have enough resources, then presumably they will continue to reproduce and so on and so forth. And so we kind of a general equation here. So we have N of T equals N naught. So this we say n naught, which is a subscript meaning the initial, so n naught. And then the exponential e to the rt. And of course, there's no numbers in here. This is very general. So r is the growth rate. n of t is the population on the left. So this is our output, and we have to input things like the rate, so how fast. And if that rate is negative, it could be how, how fast does it decrease. If it's a fraction, it could be how slow does it increase, okay? So the rate doesn't have to be, and we saw that just with the virus example. Uh, T on both sides is time. And this n naught means the initial value. So you could think of the 15 cases that we just saw. It was 15, right? That was where n naught was. So I'll say initial conditions. So I'll just write that equation down. e to the rt, and here's the question. So a particular breed of deer was introduced to an island 10 years ago. You could think of this as happening to New Zealand. Uh, there were no native deer here until a couple hundred years ago. Uh, so deer was introduced as well as a number of other pieces of wildlife, generally just for people's hobbies and pleasure, whether it was good or bad. Uh, so the current population is estimated to be 726. So this is something that a biologist might do or someone that works at uh, the dock might do. They go out and they estimate numbers in the wild. Uh, and then they also have a growth rate. So 18% here, so that's positive. So that means if you have 100, next year you'll have 118. So how many deer were released initially? Estimate the population in five years. What will be the increase during the 10th year? And when will it reach 6,000? So again, these are all things that a conservationist or a biologist might be calculating in order to have an idea of what the population is doing.
Okay, so the rate is 18%, so that means I need an R value, and we're gonna convert it from a percentage into a number, okay? So that's 0 0.18 for R. T is always going to be in years, so 10 years would be T equals 10. So there's a bit of working out with the timeline on this one. So how many deers were released initially? Well, that was 10 years in the past. That's right. Uh, the current deer population is 726. So this is going to be N. And if it started 10 years ago, this is going to be N at 10. So I won't go through the entire details, but for part A, you're looking at something like this. N at 10, maybe I'll write the whole thing down. N at 10, that's today, remember, equals 726. And that can be modeled using the initial value times E to the growth rate. So the growth rate is gonna stay the same the whole time. So this would be, you know, species dependent, depending on the environment and the conditions and all that, you know, what type of predators they have. Uh, and then to the T, so I also sub in T equals 10 up here. So for part A, the only unknown is N naught. So that's what I'm looking for. Solve for N naught, which is initial number of deer. So 0 0.18 times 10, you can do that. That's going to be 1.8 E to the 1.8. Use your calculator for that. So shift E 1.8. And then work out for N naught. equals 120.